The final matter to come before the court today is Geraldine Thompson et al. versus Summit Pain Specialist Inc. et al. Both sides will have 15 minutes to argue. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you'd like to reserve any time for rebuttal as the appellant, I'm keeping the clock this morning, and if you let me know uh, when we get started, uh, I can keep you apprised of the passage of time. Also, when you get started, if you could let us know if you wish to divide your 15 minutes as appellants in this case. Um, we've read the briefs, and we're ready to proceed anyway. Thank you, Honor. Um, we're going to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, and then on behalf of Dr. James Bressey, I am going to use the first 10 minutes, and on behalf of Dr. Annette Bressey, uh, Mr. Scott Riley will use two minutes. So I think by my math, that should be 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. May it please the court, my name is Doug Bleak, and I'm here on behalf of defendant appellant Dr. James Bressey. And on behalf of Dr. Bressey, we ask that this court reverse two orders of the trial court. The first order that should be reversed is the trial court's release of the bail money from the criminal case that should only have been released to Dr. Annette Bressey. The second order that we ask this court to reverse is the trial court's refusal to vacate the pre-judgment attachment order of February 2014. With respect to the issue revolving the bail, the trial court lacked jurisdiction to even release any funds relating to the bail. Also, the trial court's order is in direct violation of Summit County Local Rule 23.02 a and B, and also Revised Code 2937.40 and .41. It is clear the four corners of both the local rule and the statute that bail can only be released to the person who initially posted it. Local Rule 23.02A also says that None of the proceeds can be applied to any fees or costs. In this case, the trial court erroneously ordered that $90,000 be released to the plaintiff's counsel in this civil case, and that the clerk also keep $10,000 to be applied to the cost. Revised Code 23.02, I mean, I'm sorry, Local Rule 23.02 and the Revised Code is mandatory. There is no room for discretion, interpretation, as to how funds are released regarding bail. Local Rule 23.02b specifically says that the funds shall be released to the person who initially posted the bail. It also says that the check shall be made in the name of the person who initially posted the, the bail, and in this case, Dr. Annette Bressey. 23.02b also says that that check shall be sent to the person who initially posted the bail. And finally, the last sentence of 23.02 says, no other way to release the funds in a bail is authorized. The Supreme Court in State XRL Denton also said that, that Revised Code 2937.40 forbids any other type of release. In this case, counsel, the trial court... Counsel, before we go any further, would you um, please address the final, appeal, final appealability of, uh, nature of this? First of all, the order that we appealed from, the trial court judge in this case specifically stated that this is a final appealable order. And that really doesn't mean a whole lot, does it? <laughs> but, Just cutting to the chase. No, but that order is part and parcel to the prejudgment attachment that was issued under Revised Code 2715. And under Revised Code 2715.46, it explicitly states that a party may appeal from an order of a prejudgment attachment or the refusal to discharge a prejudgment attachment. So pursuant to Revised Code 2715.46, that is dispositive of the final appealable order issue. Except that, um, assuming you're correct, um, except that the trial court then set it down for an additional hearing on exemptions. The crux of the order at issue 
that relates to the bail and the refusal to discharge the prejudgment attachment is the denial of the overall refusal to discharge uh, the attachment. And, so, and, and I understand that, but I guess, you know, this court has to determine its own jurisdiction, and usually you don't do piecemeal litigation, piecemeal appeals, and you could have the hearing on the exemptions, and everything could be exempted, or certain things could be exempted, not other things, at other property or monies or whatever funds, and then you would be appealing all that over again, or somebody would be. We believe that we don't even get to the issue of the exemption based upon the way that this order is worded. Um, and also, the fact that the trial court tried to um, piecemeal it into that order, we believe is not relevant to the final appealable order issue because we are appealing from the refusal of the trial court judge to discharge the prejudgment attachment. The exemption issue to us is moot. It's the overall refusal to discharge the prejudgment attachment. And under Revised Code 2715.46, it explicitly says that we can appeal from the refusal of a discharge from the prejudgment interest or prejudgment attachment. So we are here based upon the refusal of the overall, um, where the trial court did not discharge. And so part and parcel to it is also the bail, which I've already addressed, that there was no jurisdiction pursuant to the local rules and the revised code. There is no discretion. The fact that the trial court judge in this case tried to analyze where the money came from, who it was borrowed from, where bills were being paid, is completely inappropriate under the four corners of every local rule here and every statute. It's mandatory. Once again, the only person that the bail could be released to was Dr. Annette Bressy. That's it. Next, we believe that the trial court did not have jurisdiction to even address this issue, being a trial court judge in a civil matter, to invade the province of a criminal docket and order the clerk of courts in a criminal matter to release the bail is without jurisdiction. Similarly, we have a pending interlocutory appeal where this trial court judge also invaded the province of the criminal docket and ordered a psychological evaluation or obtained that from the criminal file. A civil judge cannot go to the criminal docket, not only that, to a different judge. So we don't believe that the trial court judge had any jurisdiction with regard to the bail and the release of that. So to finish with the bail, there is no doubt that there was no discretion no right to interpret how to release this. There was only one way to release the bail, and that is to Dr. Annette Bressy, who indisputably was the one who posted it, and there was no jurisdiction. It then takes us into the jurisdiction of this court in the first place, this trial court judge in the first place, to order a prejudgment attachment. We need to look at this case procedurally, and the order is at place, to show that this case was not properly assigned to, to Judge Cosgrove pursuant to Summit County Local Rules 7.1, 7.11, and 7.19. The order at issue here that the plaintiffs rely upon to say that the entire matter was transferred to Judge Cosgrove is the November 20th, 2013 order. But that order is in the name of Judge Cosgrove it is typed Judge Cosgrove's order. It is her signature block and some signature that the plaintiffs are trying to decipher. That is Judge Parker, who was the administrative judge at the time. But the order is on the signature block of Judge Cosgrove. It is her own order attempting to assign all these cases to her. That is not done consistently with the local rules or the Supreme Court rules of superintendents. So we believe that the trial court did not have any jurisdiction whatsoever in February of 2014 to initially order the prejudgment attachment. And therefore, once again, in September, when we filed our motions, we were entitled to relief from judgment from that prejudgment attachment and also discharge from that. 
If this court deems that even as an assignment to Judge Cosgrove, we need to look at the order of Judge Cosgrove subsequently. And let me also mention that when that 2013 order was placed on the docket, there were subsequent cases involving plaintiffs against Dr. Bressey. So you cannot assign a visiting judge to cases that subsequently were filed. So we think that it's defective for that reason too. But more importantly here, is that even Judge Cosgrove in April 2014, working under the impression that everything was assigned to her as a visiting judge, on April 14, 2014, there's an order in which she stated that these cases, and listed all the cases, are consolidated for discovery purposes only. Discovery. Based upon her own admission in that order, she could not handle substantive issues outside of discovery. Obviously, the prejudgment attachment order wasn't within the jurisdiction that she tried to give herself in April of 2014. And you've utilized just over 10 minutes. Pardon me? You've utilized just okay. about 10 minutes. Based upon that, we believe even when we go further into the facts upon which she relied to not discharge this, we're no longer um, relevant. Dr. Bressey was acquitted of 26 of 27 counts in the criminal matter. The only count that he was found guilty of was of, of, of a person who is not even a plaintiff. So the circumstances changed. There was no longer a reason for the, pre, the prejudgment attachment. So we believe that the court didn't even have jurisdiction, and then subsequently there were reasons under Civil Rule 60B and under Revised Code 2715.01 for it to be discharged. So based upon that, we believe the bail order should be vacated and the refusal to discharge the pre-judgment attachment must be vacated. And I'm going to defer now to Mr. Riley. Thank you. Mr. Riley, there are four minutes total remaining. Does that include the three for rebuttal? That, yes, no, that does mean. include. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Please, the court. Good afternoon, your honors. Uh, Scott Riley on behalf of Dr. Annette Bressy, and I'm here to ask the court to overturn and reverse Judge Cosgrove's decision to release the bail money that belongs to Annette Bressy. Uh, the law is clear. Judge Cosgrove had no authority to release that money to anybody but Dr. Annette Bressy. Uh, the Supreme Court specifically states that the, the Vice Code forbids anybody releasing money in this fashion. Uh, Dr. Bressy, Dr. Annette Bressy, was not a party to this action originally. She was brought in as a part of the December 1st order, the order which we're appealing. But what's important from Dr. Annette Bressy's... Remind me how she was brought in. Well, <clears throat> on December 1st, Judge Cosgrove issued the order allowing for the attachment and also releasing the bond money. In that order, she granted plaintiff's motion to amend the uh, complaint and bring Annette Bressy in as a third party uh, defendant. So and the order of attachment is already? The order of attachment occurred back in January of 2014. It had already been entered by the time she was brought in. And there, in appellee's site to several hearings that were held in the record, none of which Annette Bressy were, was a part of. She attended one hearing, and it was on March 31st. Every other evidentiary hearing, she was not a part of. Basically, Your Honors, this is her money, this is her property, she's entitled to do with it what she will, and the court deprived her of that with no jurisdiction whatsoever. Thank you. Please, the court, Larry Scanlon, on behalf of the plaintiffs in the underlying action. First, I, I would like to address the issue of whether or not these cases were properly assigned to Judge Cosgrove. I think the administrative judge, uh, Judge Parker, did assign these in November of 2013. I don't have that order right in front of me. It's in the docket. Uh, it was signed by the judge, and Mr. Leak is a latecomer to the game. Uh, so I can understand maybe some confusion as to the sequence of events, but if I could review that for the court, I'd, I'd like to do so. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bressy have been married for some time, and we first notified Mr. Bressy of the potential claims, and I call him Mr. Bressy at this time because he has surrendered his license to be a physician. And I advised him that my clients were considering a malpractice claim. That was in April of 2013. 
Lawsuits were commenced in May of 2013, and Dr. Annette Bressy is, was aware that those lawsuits were uh, filed, and I'll talk about that uh, later here. Because the issue becomes whether or not she was aware and whether or not this attempt to create a safe harbor should be voided by the court as it was in the trial court below. So, lawsuits were filed. Judge Teodosio got the first group of cases. There were about six, seven. When we went to the first prejudgment attachment hearing in November of 2013, Mr. Bressy was represented by counsel, and uh, it was, as you know, under that rule, there can be an ex parte hearing. The court decided that there would be a full hearing, decided that his docket with the capital cases was too busy, and assigned uh, through Judge Parker the, the case to a visiting judge. Thereafter, other cases were filed. They were all assigned to Judge Cosgrove. The question that remains open is how are we going to try these cases starting in 2016? Uh, and while they, and there was no agreement from the other side as to how to proceed, there was agreement that for purposes of discovery, we would, we would proceed in a joint fashion. The motion for attachment was originally filed in the Thompson case, which is the caption that is now for all cases because of the consolidation. Geraldine Thompson was one of those plaintiffs. She was also a, one who testified at the criminal trial. There were other plaintiffs in that case, including Cynthia Bonnev, who did not testify in the criminal case. But she did testify in September of 2014. After the lawsuit was filed and the hearing was asked for, uh, there was a requirement to get more documents to determine what, if anything, was owned jointly, what was owned separately. We determined that many of the assets of Jim Bressy were already in judgment-proof type investments. Now, the allegations in this case is that he engaged in non-consensual touching of female patients, not male patients, in the context of a physician-patient relationship. That's the case. That's the claim. That's the claim that we are more likely than not going to recover in a civil case, a judgment against him, where there is no insurance and where the assets have already been sequestered by lawyers over decades. He now has his passport, and his freedom will be uh, uh, obviously fueled if this court releases that, that attachment order. He was convicted of a crime. That crime was of molesting an employee by the name of Beverly Hudak. That case is also on appeal. There are also a dozen motions for summary judgment pending against him supported by affidavits. All of this evidence, uh, or at least most of it, was presented to the trial court. She heard Geraldine Thompson testify. She heard Mark Roberts, who was an eyewitness to molestation, inside the procedure room under anesthetic. And we have two of those clients in our cases that we know of as of now. That witness was never called in the criminal case. So the fact is, whether he was acquitted of a number of those accounts or not, there still remains the likelihood, the probability of a recovery, which is the attachment order. I, I've leapt to the appropriateness of the order because the attack here today is somehow multifaceted. She didn't have jurisdiction, the trial court didn't have jurisdiction, but if she did, it was entered improperly. But I didn't hear anything on the substance. So while the statute gives them the opportunity to challenge that, this was an order that was entered in February 21st of 2014 on the bond issue as well on the bond issue as well. Now, we discovered after the entry of the judgment on February 21st of 2014 that there was an undisclosed property in Hilton Head valued at $557,000 that had been sold during the pendency of these hearings and the money transfer, the net proceeds of $220,000 
which was admittedly from the sale of a house owned by Annette and Jim Bressy, was put in the sole name of Annette Bressy. When that information came to light, Judge Cosgrove said on March 12th, we need to have her in. A hearing was scheduled. John Irwin said he was going to represent her or find a lawyer to represent her on March 24th of 2014. Annette Bressy appeared at the hearing with Attorney Riley. They were not prepared to go forward on the issue of what was, where was the money from the sale of the house, and what is the, the, the history of the money for the bail bond. It is insufficient under the case law that addresses 2937.40 for the person who posts the bond to just say, it's my money. And in fact, Annette Bressy has never said that. She never said it in an affidavit. She said it came from her personal account. She never said it at the hearing on March 31st when she was cross-examined. She did use that money not only to pay her bills but Jim Bressy's bills. And in fact, interestingly enough, this assignment was made in between that time. The assignment of the bail money to, to Attorney Callahan was made in mid-March of 2014 for the benefit of Jim Bressy. So the court rightly looked at 2937.40C to determine, regardless of who posted it, whose money was it. And in this case, either there was a legal interest in that money or there was a beneficial interest, and the attachment order had said any and all money or property, real or intangible, in the state or without the state. That case is the state of Ohio versus Ahmed that says just because someone comes in and says it came from my account, that does not necessarily mean it was their money. That's uh, Ohio versus Ahmed, 2007 Ohio app, 8th District 2, uh, 2007, uh, Lexus 5837. In fact, the testimony was disregarded by the trial judge and determined that she wouldn't believe anything she said. And I will tell you that that was the tenor in that hearing because of the transfer of this Hilton Head property and the, the taking of the $220,000 that was put in a personal account. And then she used a portion of that to pay lawyers. There's also a, a Second Circuit case interpreting 2937-40C, Landau versus Vaillant. That is also in our brief. And it's whether or not you could attach a bail in a related civil matter. It is appropriate to say that somehow there was an invasion. The fact is this was an attempt to conceal assets, which is part of the parcel of the underlying claim. And they, we filed for fraudulent conveyance as well anticipating in this situation that there may be that interest in, in hiding assets. So was this bond subject of that filing for fraudulent conveyance? Yes, it was, Your Honor. It uh, we were concerned early on as to what monies they had and where they were going. Uh, the initial hearing was in as I said, there was a preliminary start in November of 2013. It was reconvened and there was a full hearing January 17th of 2014. And we became aware, obviously, that the bond had been posted. But does so, the fraudulent conveyance action still pending? It is still pending. And, you know, in the old days, we, we didn't have to bring those until we had a judgment. Now we've been told we have to incorporate that in the action as we proceed. So the, the, the defendant's on notice that there's a four-year look back. But the point of that is that uh, this party, to say that she, had un she was unaware until September or December is just, just not correct. She was aware on March 24th. She testified on March 31st. She was aware that that order had been entered. The time to challenge that would have been 30 days from that notice. 
for her to come in and say that bond money was all mine. Instead, there was a hearing on March 31st, so we, we sort of cut through that process, and the judge had a hearing, and she made an explicit finding that that money was subject to the attachment that she had issued at the conclusion of the criminal case. She was made a party after the March? She was. She was. We, after that hearing, uh, it became clear we filed our motion to amend. I don't, the court didn't rule for quite some time. If you look at the docket, you'll see there's been a lot of activity. But ultimately, she did grant that motion. We named her as a party individually because of the conduct that we saw that uh, related to her personally. We still don't have financial records. They were, they were ordered to give us the exempted document, uh, exempted assets by December 23rd, 2014. That still hasn't happened. You seem to um, be arguing that she should have, wife um, should have um, filed an appeal when the original attachment was rendered of the bail money. Um, but the statute does talk in terms of also one failure to discharge or discharge. That is the discharge of the PJ, the, the prejudgment attachment. And I think there's been an, a, an attempt to put a, a sort of blend these two together for the court. And I think they're distinctly separate. I, I think there is uh, under 29-37-40, uh, there is an analysis that allows them to, to ask for the bail money to go directly to them. What we're saying is that while they had a right to appeal the uh, February 21st order, Jim Bressy did, and Annette Bressy as well, in my opinion, on the bond issue, if it was truly her money, they did not do anything. They waited, and then they filed a motion in September, and they filed a motion to vacate the PGA, the prejudgment attachment, and the bond issue. There's just a lot of procedural issues with this case. It and is. I understand your point that there are perhaps two distinct things, but I guess where I'm getting a little confused is you're holding her feet to the fire saying she should have appealed, but you're also saying she's not even a proper party to this appeal now, but you're saying somehow she would have been had the ability to appeal something that she wasn't even a party to. It seems to me well, like maybe it should have been something more like um, you know, some kind of separate action to be filed. Well, she has a right under Rule 24 to intervene. Well, I understand She had that, that right to intervene and say, wait a minute, Judge, you've, you've just assigned uh, at the conclusion of my husband's criminal case money that is was mine and come in and prove that it is hers. Mm -hmm. Be that as it may, there was a hearing on, on March 31st and another one on September 17th. And the same basic argument was made. It came from my personal account. That's not the end of the story. This judge has had two hearings on this as to who, who, whose money that is and whether or not there's a legal or beneficial interest that would allow that attachment to go to the bond upon its release. Are you still uh, advocating that this is not a final problem? Well, I... You know, that's a mystery wrapped in an enigma. Uh, and uh, I know this court is very protective of that. And I, uh, I believe it's not, actually. I mean, I think they can file for a release of the attachment. It says they can do that. But there's case law that says while the exemption issue is still outstanding, uh, it's not a final appealable order. The reason we're here. I need to inform you. I'm done. Uh, you have reached the end of your lot of time, if unless you have not answered the right. question. I just wanted to hear exactly what you were saying there toward the end, if you don't care. Um, you lost your train of thought. I did. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, rather than letting, let's say there's eventually the exemption documents are provided, we'd be back here again. And so I, I, I understand that it's not really your choice. I just was curious as to whether you were still advocating that it wasn't. That's all. That's all. Okay. I guess. Thank you, Your Honor. We unfortunately, unfortunately, how we have to determine whether we have jurisdiction, whether yes. the parties agree or not. I understand that, Your Honor. Yeah, I know.
Thank you. Thank you. Council, you have two enhancements remaining. First of all, it is a final appeal order. I will advise you uh, 2715.46. There is no doubt it falls under that. And the portion about the bail falls under that. With regard to the bail, it is mandatory. It shall be released to Dr. Annette Bressy under the local rule and the revised code. You cannot get around that. It specifically says any other release is not authorized. With regard to appealing from the time back in February 2014, Dr. Annette Bressy was not a party. Also, we have a right under the statute, the refusal to discharge we, is a final appeal order. That's why we're here. In terms of me being in this case, with all due respect, I know the record. I know that in 2013, this order was Judge Cosgrove's order, signing the case to herself. It's her name, <coughs> her signature thing, not in compliance with the local rule 7.11. Are we going to find in the record as to how Judge Cosgrove became involved, period? I mean, is there a standing order that she's a visiting judge? Well, I, I think that she is a visiting judge under the Supreme Court's assignments as a visiting judge, but not for this particular case of the MEC under Local Rule 7.11. You're not going to see that. So that's why we're standing by I this I understand order. your argument, but I guess I need the foundation. <laughs> no, you're not going to see that um, in terms of anything being assigned to her. And even if you do deem this an assignment, she herself said her jurisdiction was for... Um, discovery purposes only, not this. And then on the substance of this, she relied upon the, the uh, testimony of uh, Geraldine Thompson. The charges were found. Um, Dr. Bressy was acquitted. So the basis that she relied upon in February no longer existed. She relied upon Mark Roberts, a former employee who admitted they could not identify any victims, any time, date, anything. Then she relied upon Cynthia Bonneth, who provided testimony at September 11th hearing in which we as counsel for Dr. Bressy did not have notice and did not attend and did not have a chance to cross-examine her. Her claim is barred by the statute of limitations, which is the subject of the motion uh, for summary judgment. So all the factors that she considered under 2715.01a, which is 6 and 10, no longer exist to justify that this prejudgment attachment remain intact. So from a jurisdictional standpoint, it should be vacated. From a factual standpoint, it should be vacated, and the release should be vacated the way that the judge did it in this case, and that should be left to the clerk and the criminal matter to release that to Dr. Annette yeah. Russell. Yeah. Thank you. I could be here all day. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I must inform you regrettably that you've also reached the end of your allotted time for today. Thank, Thank you, you all for your presentations this morning. The court will take the matter of your advisement. Issue a written decision which will be mailed to all parties to this appeal, as well as post on the Ohio Supreme Court website, which can be linked to the United States Court of Appeals website. We are adjourned until Thursday.